Welcome to the Creative Community. I'm your host, David Starkey, and my guest this time is poet Paul Willis. Paul, welcome. Great to be here, David. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Well, you have been a guest on the, the show back in its earlier incarnation, so it's great to have you here in the early version of uh, Creative Community 2.0. That was silent film, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dinosaurs were out there running the cameras. Yeah, it was a long time ago. Um, but Paul, we're here to talk about a couple of books that you have. We're mostly going to focus on one called Dear at Twilight, and I'll show the camera what this looks like. This is Poems from the North Cascades. And then you're briefly going to touch on a, a newer book, which is called Little Rhymes for Lowly Plants. And um, you're not going to feature this one, but I, I think it's a great, uh, great book, and I'm, I'm happy that we'll have a chance to, to hear this. So you are the author of, of six collections of poems. They've been coming pretty rapidly over the last four or five years, huh? Well, I guess so. They just happen. Yeah. So um, we're here to hear your poetry. Would you be willing to read a, a poem to start off the show? Sure. Uh, this collection, Dear at Twilight, uh, came from a time a few years ago where I got to serve as an artist in residence in North Cascades National Park, which is in Washington State, uh, right up against the Canadian border. A very wild, rugged, mm, uh, yeah. mountainous park, not as well known as Mount Rainier or Olympic National Park, and, and not one you can see real well from the car. Mm -hmm. uh, but you got to get you out have there. You yeah. get into the backcountry, which... Uh, I did. Uh, uh, I like to think of it as your tax dollars at work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Thank but, you, tax dollars. <laughs> this, this is a park with a, a, a little bit of a literary heritage. Back in the uh, 50s, uh, the beat poets, uh, Gary Snyder and Jack Kerouac, uh, Philip Whalen, a couple of others, uh, occupied fire lookouts, these mm -hmm. lonely fire lookouts for entire summers. Right. And, uh, was a source of inspiration to them. And uh, of course, uh, uh, those poets have become a source of inspiration to uh, a mm -hmm. lot of other people, right. and especially Jack Kerouac's Look Out on uh, Desolation Peak. Which is, is the source of uh, his novel. Right. What's the name of the, the book? Well, I think it's called Desolation. Desolation. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, I. I, anyway, I, it, here's a poem I'll read called Desolation Peak when I hiked up. And um, Jack Kerouac was not on top of my uh, list of favorites of writers, but uh, this, this hike changed my mind a little bit. Okay. So this poem's called Desolation Peak. Jack, I owe you an apology. Some years ago, I left a note on Matterhorn Peak Jack Kerouac is a weenie. All those tributes to you and Snyder overflowing the register, I couldn't stand it. What with your being out of shape and hung over and not even making the top. But today, sweating up switchback after switchback from the shores of Ross Lake, through fog, through rain, through hail, through drifts, through blowdown and through shredded boots, my hat is off to you in the wind as I sit on the doorstep of your lookout, gazing across the damned, drowned Skagit to the darkness of Mox Peaks, the ones described by Fred Becky as a good place for a funeral. That's you, Jack. You're Moxie to be up here for two months and more before you died. I was wrong. You're more than twice the man I thought. The clouds are closing in again, and it's starting to snow. I'm out of here. <laughs> 
Well, you know, it is, uh, it, it's interesting that you start the poem off by registering <laughs> the fact that um, uh, Kerouac and the Beats maybe aren't direct inspirations for you. But Snyder, especially with someone who went out into the, yeah. the natural world a mm -hmm. lot, I'm curious though more about um, what connection that might have for Kerouac because here's a guy who, you know, he's famously went on the road and he's writing about a lot of urban scenes. What was it about suddenly going into this great solitude that um, somehow fed some part of his writerly soul, would you say? Well, I wouldn't know. Uh, it, you know, if you read if you read, I, th I think the book is Desolation. I'm trying to, Desolation Angels, is that it? It may be. Yeah. Uh, it, it starts with him being at the lookout and he can't wait to get out of there. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and the thrust of the book is all about sort of rejoining the urban scene with a vengeance. So, um, it, you know, it did a little something with him. I, I think Snyder uh, was the one who got this fire lookout thing started right. among this group. Right. And, I, I think he probably more authentically inhabited the role. Right, right. Uh, and, and Philip Whelan mm -hmm. as well, a quieter member of the Beats. So, uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a wild park and it was wilder then. It's mm -hmm. amazing mm -hmm. that those, those guys spent the time that they did in those high, lonely places. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I've known you and your poems for getting pretty close to 20 years now, and, and I know that a, a lot of your work is written actually out there in on a hike, a camping. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, why is that so important to be, you're like a plein air painter in a way, you know, uh -huh. you're out there on scene. Why, why is that so important for your work? Yeah, you know, I guess just being in touch mm -hmm. uh, in the moment there uh, and trying to write in the, in, in the presence mm -hmm. of what's in, inspiring me. Um, that was the gift of this this residency to be by myself and and uh, and have the, the the leisure to stop and, mm -hmm. and write whenever something attracted my attention or some some words came into my mind. I mean, I, I love backpacking with other people mm -hmm. too, but it's it's a more social mm -hmm. experience. You're away from your focus on yeah. the, what's around you. Yeah. I'm wondering about your composition process. Are you, do you have a little notebook you're taking down notes and then you come back to the campfire at night and put it all together or how does that work? Yeah, well, you know, I have a notebook in my pack which I have to take off mm -hmm. And then, and then I keep thinking of new lines. I mean, it, it, it would look comical. You're going, chin, 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 chin. <laughs> you don't make much I progress. I keep picking <laughs> off this heavy pack. I, I should probably arrange a better way. But, uh, yeah, I, I, I keep writing and revising mm -hmm. as I go and then, you know, get back to the cabin and yeah. keep, keep revising. Right. Yeah. And then everything kind of comes together often in a really spectacular way. Um, it tries to. It tries to. <laughs> Well, let's, let's, let's hear another poem since yeah. we got you reading from, um, from your book. You know, I mentioned uh, in this previous poem this uh, dammed uh, lake on the Skagit River. It's a major river in the Northwest. It's Ross Lake. And uh, I think I wrote this poem maybe a day or two after climbing up uh, Desolation Peak okay. uh, from the from the edge of the reservoir. It's called uh, Deer at Twilight. Yesterday evening, from my campsite in the forest on the edge of the reservoir, I saw a deer walk cautiously to the end of a long sandy point. So far I was, at first I thought it a coyote or someone's dog or who knows, maybe a wolf. But it was, in fact, a single deer, diminished by distance, a silhouette against the sheen. I could tell by the way it held its head innocently high and alert, and the way it bent its neck to drink. As twilight faded, I could not say if it were standing on sand or water. It was so quiet. The snowy peaks beyond were bathed in such pure glow that had the deer walked all the way across the lake, delicately printing the surface with each fine hoof, I would have bowed down and believed. Hmm. 
Well, the title poem in a book typically has some extra resonance to it, mm -hmm. and there is a kind of conjunction between the religious and the natural world mm -hmm. there in that final couple of lines. Mm -hmm. Could you talk about that? Uh, well, the deer is walking on water, <laughs> <laughs> as supposedly Jesus did. Right. Um, so there's this uh, call to, uh, you know, some sort of divine presence. Right. I, I guess it says, <laughs> Wordsworth was so popular, uh, you know, he kept pointing to this sort of thing, and, and uh, people who were firmly Christian claimed him, and people who were more pantheist claimed him. Mm -hmm. I don't know where this poem belongs yeah. either. <laughs> well, so who claims you? <laughs> maybe a, a, yeah. both, uh, I think both camps might want to claim uh, your yeah, work. Yeah, maybe I, I am a person of Christian faith, but you know, I, I see over and over as, uh, as John Muir did, um, as a sort of a presence in nature or an expression mm -hmm. of, of divine love in nature, right. and, and maybe that's a selective vision, uh, you know, there's also nature red and tooth and claw, sure. as Tennyson yeah. says. Right. Uh, but, but, but maybe but those two me, aren't so far apart. Yeah, you know, for me, uh, you know, there's always been a, a sustenance there ever since I was very young, mm -hmm. sort of venturing out for a day at a time, and then I got older days mm -hmm. at a time, and, 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 and not, not a place that I felt scared, but a place I felt sustained and comforted. Right, so right. I don't know where to theologically locate that. That gets tricky. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's, it's, it's interesting because I don't think of you as a dogmatic Christian yeah. in any way. And, and Jesus calls for people to evangelize, but maybe this is your kind of evangelical maybe work. It <laughs> it's is. your poetry maybe it um, is. rather than going out in, yeah. in some sort of more direct way. Yeah. Um, well, I always think of uh, Mary, the mother of Jesus, who, you know, had Jesus in her womb. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a, we have a daughter with twins right now. Her womb is very large. <laughs> uh, she doesn't need to announce that right. she's pregnant. And, and so maybe I'd like to think of the the poems can in womb or embody whatever my uh, convictions are. Yeah. It doesn't need to be announced. Yeah. Um, it will. Perhaps it that's will, the way. It will. <laughs> at, yeah. some, at some point, uh -huh. it will come out. Yeah. 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 Well, let's, let's, let's segue. We're sort of kind of in, in the middle yeah. of the program. We wanted to kind of do a middle section. And, and you have some, some kind of haiku-like poems uh, in, in Deer at Twilight. And then I'm going to talk you into reading a couple from uh, Little Rhymes for Lowly Plants. Yeah. Not haiku exactly, but I call them hike. Haiku, that's right. <laughs> that's and, a very Paul Willis joke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. But... Uh, I, f I found a lot of the poems are species specific. They're just little okay. poems of encounter. Uh, they, they they personally address these plants okay. often. Um, maybe we maybe I got that. lonely yeah, out there. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of personification going on. I, I like uh, you know speaking of theology that the Jewish theologian Martin. Buber talked about an I thou relationship, mm -hmm. and I, I just sort of wanted that. So here's one uh, actually from the San Juan Islands at the foot of the North Cascades uh, about the madrona or madrone tree, which has peeling bark. Madrona on the San Juans. Madrona, that strip tease of yours is working again. The way you pearl out of your bark following your natural bent, turns my head in smooth surprise. Your arms reach over the bay with longing, that supple skin, slightly sunburned, blooming like a dusky rose. Very sensual poem to, <laughs> <laughs> to a plant, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Don't let your wife see that one. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't think she's too jealous. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, here's another. I, I discovered there's a tree uh, that grows 
all the way from the east coast to the west coast of the United States. It's the paper birch. Oh, okay. It grows right along the, the northern border of the 48 states. And uh, this little poem's called Blowdown, which is what you call a tree that has fallen over. Blowdown. Paper birch, you are one of the only trees to cross this continent of ours. But right now, all you are crossing is my trail, your prostrate trunk about to publish on its scrolls a full account of all your travels. Mm. Well, memento mori. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. Um, here's a little one called Horsetail. Uh, about those little reed-like sure. plants that are very ancient, actually, according to the fossil record. Horsetail. Little ancient forest of pipes, the reed section of the Cascade Orchestra. You were as old as an instrument of nature can be, counting back the endless codas, fossils, put you in the pit, along with those Tchaikovsky-loving dinosaurs stomping out their timpani, marching to their own bassoons. Mm. So sometimes you, you, you start writing a little conceit, mm -hmm. this continued metaphor goes on, that yeah. shows right, up. Right, yeah. 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 I don't know where it gets you, but it's fun to try. Well, could we hear a couple from Little Ryan's for Holy Plants? Or you got one more from uh, uh, Jerry No, Twilight? this is fine. Uh, I, I found as I was out walking and, and, and writing during the day, at, as I got tired near the end of the day, I would start to rhyme. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know yeah, what that no, means. No, why would that be? I don't know why. Yeah, it's just, uh, you're walking in... Dun, 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 yeah, dun. and as I was putting together uh, this, this main collection, Dear at Twilight, Poems from the North Cascades, I, I kept the rhyming poems out, but I realized I liked them in a right. certain way. Uh, and I, I'll just read a couple. Uh, that are from that collection. Um, uh, yarrow. Yarrow, yarrow, ferny pharaoh, ruling by the roadside here, in the blood and in the marrow of the northern hemisphere. <laughs> uh, or, uh, Menzies larkspur, which is a, a, we have larkspur flowers here in California too. They look like they're about to sort of fly off the mm. stalk. Menzies larkspur. Larkspur, are you sure you wish to fly? Cobalt comet in the sky. Bluest blue, sweet eye of mirth. Why don't you come down to earth? So, well, you know, I'm, I'm hearing there, there is a little, uh, the, the, your uh, title, Little Rhymes for Lily Plants, uh -huh. has almost kind of a nursery rhyme type yeah, of a, a feel of them, to it, and some yeah. of them have that. But I'm also thinking of another great nature poet, Robert Frost, who mm -hmm. um, frequently wrote in rhyme about the yeah. natural world. Was yeah. he in any way an inspiration or an echo yeah. for you? As a little writing? bit. I, I would say more another uh, Robert from an earlier era, Robert Herrick, mm. the, a 17th century right. uh, poet. Who frequently wrote about religion. Uh, he did. He was, a, he was an Anglican minister, but he, he, he wrote uh, lots of poems about flowers, usually... Uh, how uh, they're beautiful, they're not around very long, and neither mm -hmm. are we. Mm -hmm. So right. uh, here, here's a poem that would be directly, I think, descended from Robert Herrick. It's called Shrubby Penstemon. Penstemon, tell me when your violet's through, and I'll know when you go to exit too. <laughs> Now some of these are just plain silly. Well, let's hear a little silly. Okay, there is a there is a kind of ground cover called salal. Uh, it grows in the lower elevations of Cascade of the Cascades and also on the coast. Uh, salal. I had a friend in school named Sal. 
When she got drunk, she said, Salal. The gods then turned her to a plant as plain and chaste as my great aunt. But on the trail with my missus, Sal stops my boots with her wet kisses. <laughs> I think I'm left a little spe <laughs> speechless by that one. Whatever I was going to say just popped right out of my head. Um, so these two books, are they both from the same publisher? No. Um, Dear at Twilight's from uh, Stephen F. Austin, State University Press okay. in Texas. Uh, Little Rhymes from Lily Plants is from White Violet Press, okay. which is in Utah. Okay. Yeah. And they specialize in, in uh, nature uh, poetry? They specialize. White Violet oh, Press poetry? is all uh, formal verse, formal rhymed and metered yeah. verse, which so is that all that. is. Yeah. 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 Well, we have about like, I don't know, seven minutes left. Um, I'd love to get back to Deer at Twilight. I know that you have at least one or two more kind of longer, I won't say substantial poems because I love the, I love the short, um, lighter ones, but some, some, sure. something a little bit longer. Here's a woodpecker poem. I don't know. Well, we've all had the experience of seeing birds slam into a window. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this was back at the cabin. Round one. Just now, a pileated woodpecker piled his red pillium right into the sliding glass door and then retreated to the trunk of a Douglas fir. A collision like that would put most any other bird on its back, claws up for a KO. But the woodpecker, being a woodpecker, with a skull as crushable as an anvil and a brain like a rubber paddle ball, just seems to shrug it off, perhaps convinced that his rival reflection in the window has finally met his nemesis in a furious jousting match in the skies. On his vertical perch, the woodpecker appears, well, pileated, a bit ruffled along the crest, but from this angle, he sees no sign of his Narcissus-like opponent. And perhaps he misses him. <laughs> well, that's kind of a, a classic Paul Willis ending, I think. But, uh, How so? Well, uh, it, it's, it's humorous, um, and yet there's a, a, a note of, I think, sadness almost, mm -hmm. right? You know. Mm -hmm. um, you you miss yourself, yeah, uh, and and so I mm. I, I think that's mm. that is mm. this classic Willis. Oh well, thank you. <laughs> we yeah. have I think probably a time for about one more poem, okay. Paul, one more longish poem. So um, what would you like to finish us off with, and then maybe we'll talk just some sure. general things about poetry. Yeah, well, I end with a poem called uh, "Sustainability," kind of a catchword these days. Uh, it's about another kind of tree, the, the larch tree, uh, which looks like an evergreen, but its needles turn yellow and fall off every winter. They grow at high elevations in the north. Sustainability. A few weeks after my mother died, I dreamed that she was waiting for me in a ravine of spring green larches. There was no worry in her eyes. And she sat there with her knees drawn up, content to be in the filtered sunlight. Funny, because she never lived among larch trees. My mom grew up on an orange grove and raised us in the Douglas fir. I do not live among them either, apart from my rare visits to the North Cascades. But when I'm here, as now I am, sitting barefoot on cutthroat pass among amber larches, bathing every bowl and basin, I have a sense that she's okay and that I am too, born to witness what I can within this green and golden world which still persists with or without us, but mostly with us, I've come to believe. Things and people pass away but that's when they become themselves. There's a new heaven, a new earth around and about us, and not much different from the better parts of the old. We don't live there very often, 
But when we do, eternity ignites in a moment, light in the larches that shines and shines. So there's a light and things and people pass away and mm. that's when they become themselves. Mm -hmm. That's a, a paradox. Can you explain that to me? It you? is. Oh, of course I can't <laughs> explain it. It's a paradox. <laughs> <laughs> you just, it sounds good. Well, uh, okay. That's a, very Give it a try. that's a very Christian line. That's, I, yeah. I guess I am evangelizing a little bit. I, you know, if, if there's some truth to the, 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 the resurrection and, and proceeding from a perishable to an imperishable um, body, as the Apostle Paul says, I, mm -hmm. I guess that's bound up in that line. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Well, you know, in our, in our last uh, few minutes here, uh, you are a teacher at, at Westmont College and mm -hmm. have been for many, many years. I um, always love to ask our guests if they can give some advice to people who are out there writing, whether they're just starting or uh, mm -hmm. have been maybe writing for a long time mm -hmm. um, and aren't sure what to do. So what, what's, what, you know, I, I'm watching this, I feel I'm a poet, um, but I'm not exactly sure how to make everything happen. What, mm -hmm. about that. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I think the first thing is, is, is to be, be kind to ourselves mm -hmm. as writers and, and uh, allow ourselves to get, to get something down. Sometimes our own perfectionism or, or desire to be recognized uh, can get in the way of, of just the process of writing. Uh, and, and the second thing I'd say is, uh, you know, you don't, don't have to hit a hit a home run in every home. I mean, you don't have to explain the whole universe. I, I guess maybe I was <laughs> trying to do that in the last <laughs> you, poem a little bit. <laughs> yeah, but you know, more often it's just, well, you know, this, this little flower, this little tree in, in, in that moment. So this, 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 this horsetail reminds me of a reed instrument and mm -hmm. an orchestra. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's play with that. Right. Or, or this, this, Madrona with the the bark peeling away. Well, that's it's like clothes coming off a person. Right, you right. know, you just make a little and perhaps a seemingly insignificant association in mm -hmm. your mind. And and I think the important thing is 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 to allow yourself to to follow those little rabbit trails mm -hmm. and and not say say to ourselves, oh. That doesn't mean much, or that's not significant enough. So yeah. It, it, poem, poems are, are built out of insignificant things. Mm -hmm. And I, yeah, and I, I find myself doing that a lot, saying, "Well, this, that's okay for now." You yeah. know, yeah. Um, tomorrow I'll write the poem and <laughs> explains everything. <laughs> Well, Paul, it has been a real pleasure, as always, to have you on the show, um, to hear your books, uh, Deer at Twilight and Little Rhymes for Lowly Plants. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, David. The Creative Community is a co-production of CAPS Media in Ventura and SBTV here in Santa Barbara. In Santa Barbara, we are sponsored by a generous grant from the Diana and Simon Robb Foundation. I'm David Starkey. And we'll see you next time. Ooh.